Hello everyone, this is Harry Littman. Welcome to what we think will be a pretty special panel discussion. Uh, the idea of it was actually from many listeners on Twitter who requested that the four people you're going to be hearing from could just get together uh, outside of a cable show. Uh, we all do cable a fair bit, and we welcome the opportunity to try to do something different from just the sound bites you know, 90 second responses, wait five minutes, do another. That's the normal fare for cable. Nothing's wrong with that. Nothing's wrong with that. But we uh, we wanted to have a more sort of nuanced, dynamic, informal discussion. And that's what we're now uh, going to be doing about all things Mar-a-Lago. So let me introduce your panel, and I'll be nudging things along, but really it's a four-way conversation, and we're really pleased to welcome for it John Brennan, the former CIA director, and I, I, I everyone here goes is on MSNBC a fair bit. John, thanks for being here. Thanks for being here. Mary McCord, the former acting attorney general for national security, now a teacher at the international, at the, what does ICAP stand for? Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection at Georgetown there Law. There you go, at Georgetown Law. Uh, and Andrew Weissman, former everything, including uh, important player for uh, the Bob Mueller and many positions within the DOJ, and now also an MSNBC contributor. Good. And, and enough about that. And I'm Harry Littman. And this is not exactly a Talking Feds um, uh, presentation. It's just the four of us wanted to get together and and have a, you know, hopefully rich and dynamic conversation. So, Mar-a-Lago. I wanted to start, you know, it's we always have everything about the criminal investigation when we're doing cable, and then the kind of postscript is the national security issues. And we're told repeatedly that, you know, we have to assume the worst, which seemingly entails revelation of sources and methods, possibly killings of agents. Is there any visibility that we have that will, or even the government will have that will gain into the extent of the damages? How are we going to figure out uh, just what the uh, possible um, damage wrought by the the Trumps uh, having the documents around uh, unsafe for some, you know, twenty months? So Harry, I'm going to go first because I know the least in terms of uh, this is such an incredible panel because um, you know Mary and John just have so much national security experience. So I wanted to I divide the way I think, and that's about why this. you're going first. I, I'm, I'm going first because I kind of want to set out my theory, and then I kind of yeah. want to hear from Mary and John whether they think it's right or wrong, um, or it understates or overstates the problem. So I try to look at this by saying. Assume that neither the documents nor the information in the documents was actually provided by Donald Trump or anyone else. In other words, that we're assuming the best case scenario in terms of those two things, documents or the information contained therein. And I still think, at least in my, my narrow experience, that there is real harm to the amount of cooperation that we may get in the future from foreign countries that we routinely do business with in the intelligence community. And that includes the five eyes, but also countries that may have a more tenuous relationship with us and don't want to necessarily have it be known that they're cooperating, that I just in my limited experiences, I've I've had those difficult conversations to try and get information and get cooperation. And I could see the conversations internal to those intelligence communities being, are we really going to trust that the intelligence community, regardless of administration in the United States, is going to now be um, speaking with one voice, which used to be Without having sort of rose-colored glasses, 
I do think that used to exist. My experience at the FBI was that there was just an incredibly solid relationship from administration to administration. That's sort of my take. But again, I want to turn it over to see whether Mary and John look at it differently, think that overstates or understates the problem. I would say John should go next because he's the one who was in a position to actually be talking to those foreign governments when he was in when he was in government service most recently. And John, can I load up on your difficult (laughs) task? Because it's not just governments, it's potential individual agents who you want to recruit and have trust us that that they won't be outed. Sorry, go ahead. So you stole my thunder there, Harry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I certainly agree I with Andrew um, that uh, the callous disregard and recklessness of the Donald Trump certainly uh, gave, I think, a lot of our foreign partners pause throughout his presidency <laughs> as he was showing documents in the Oval Office to Russians and others and just would declassify even satellite imagery sort of on a whim. Uh, so that didn't give them a lot of confidence that any intelligence they provided to us would be treated with the appropriate care and uh, security. But also, I do think it's it's really a concern to an uh, organization like the CIA that has to go out and find individuals um, who are willing to report on their governments um, in Russia, China, or somewhere, um, and uh, want to have the confidence that the very, very sensitive and sometimes single source intelligence that they're able to provide is not going to be um, irresponsibly handled and mishandled. And I think just looking at those cover sheets of those documents that were found at Mar-a-Lago, they, those uh, classifications and spe- specifically the code words relate to some of the most highly sensitive, highly restricted intelligence that the U.S. intelligence community has. And um, I do not believe that there were names of sources, human sources in there, but I do have concerns that the intelligence that were contained in those documents could be revealing of either a sensitive technical collection program capability uh, that our adversaries don't know that we have, or could narrow down the, the field of individuals who might have provided insight into what's going on in foreign countries. So uh, as Andrew said, even though I think trying to do a damage assessment of this overall is going to be virtually impossible because you're not going to be able to know with any degree of certainty um, what might have been inappropriately accessed and disclosed or or what documents uh, we still don't know where they are. Uh, John, don't you think we can just talk to Donald Trump and he'll just tell us the answer to that? Yeah, you can make that call, Andrew, not me. (laughs) Can I add on just two other thoughts to John's good, really great points, which is that I think there's also damage from, um, you know, the arguments being made right now about declassification, including including declassification in just by thinking about it. Now, of course, Donald Trump's attorneys haven't asserted that. They haven't even asserted that he actually declassified anything. But this just adds to, I think, confusion in the public um, sphere about what what it means to declassify something and what the procedures are and you know how they really work and to the extent that that people are buying into this notion that declassification is that simple. I mean, I agree that the president does have authority to declassify, but not simply by thinking it. Um, Telepathic, and, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's and it's and even if we you know don't buy the, I just had to think it, and we assume there was some you know, words expressed to somebody at some point about declassification, which again, his attorneys haven't even asserted, I think it really just uh, undermines any kind of faith in, and this gets back to John's point, in the system and, and its ability to protect sources and methods. And the other point I would make is that I think we've all known this. We've seen, um, you know, President Trump, when he was president, sort of, you know, speak openly about classified information, much to the shock of many people, including with foreign leaders. But I think this callous disregard of classification and of these materials and their mishandling also would make, even assuming, as Andrew posited, that not one of these documents made it any further than the boxes or the desk drawers in Mar-a-Lago, 
you know, we don't know what things Trump may just say at any point to anybody, foreign or domestic, that he remembers from these documents. And I think we've all been worried about that for years. But it, but this example I think makes that even um, you know something to be more more concerned about, which which really has a huge impact, as John said, on the on the willingness of governments and individuals to work with our intelligence community, not to mention people within our own country. You know, I heard John say something that has made sense to me or has been my concern, but I don't think anyone has said it that that clearly. So we do have, even though we're going about it, doing the best we can, trying to, to figure things out, it is essentially impossible to gauge the damage. I mean, and so far, we've been talking about the best case uh, scenario, and we're told that, you know, the, the specialists are about trying to figure out the worst case. But so I, I it, it certainly seemed to me, and I, I definitely beat you, Andrew, for the, the most ignorant of the four of us, but it, it's, it certainly has seemed to me that like, how the hell are we going to do that? And I think the, so the answer I'm hearing, does anyone disagree that we're pretty much not going to be able, at least not in any kind of confident, comprehensive way, uh, to assess the full range of, of damage? Well, I think first right? there's the assessment about how likely is it that there was some type of unauthorized ac access. Um, and then they have to make a determination about whether or not the risk to, again, individuals, to programs, to uh, technical collection systems, whatever else, have to be adjusted, even though they think the risk might be only, you know, 10 percent or 20 percent. You know, putting someone's life on the line um, yeah. is, is one of the things that I know the agency and the bureau and others really do not want to risk the, the lives of these, whether they, you know, um, informants or uh, assets uh, and others. So it, it's going to be a really tough decision, but they're going through the process, you know, how, how likely was it? And in light of that, what the actions have to be taken. Do you think assets are already clamming up, uh, you know, ev uh, again, sort of to Andrew's point, just the, the future um, prospects, just knowing that this uh, happened. And actually, I have one more question. Can I, can I add a, well, um, let, me, let me ask that quickly. I, here I am already violating my moderator's rule. But, but so we, are, we may, all, may, may have already uh, the, the consequence of known um, agents of ours kind of, uh, you know, walking the, on the other side of the street. But, when, but Harry, I think the that US the intelligence program. community should, should well, I think there's sort of a, it's important to separate out, I think, the issue that we won't ever know the full extent, but it is the yeah. case that we could have anecdotal information, the IC could already, um, both intelligence chatter, information they're picking up, also just, um, you know, as people try and recruit assets and informants, you know, what they're being told. So, it, and of course, at the end of the day, there there may in fact be evidence with respect to the documents or the information, the documents actually having been disseminated. Mm -hmm. So all of that is information that we don't have any yeah. insight into, but I would suspect that there would be at least some anecdotal evidence that would be coming from the IC. Some assets also are put on ice. You try yeah. to limit your interaction with them out of fear that they might have been... Uh, yeah. exposed somehow. So, and that's going to thwart uh, your intelligence collection capabilities because you fear that they might be under surveillance or something else. So the, it has a lot of implications. I think the initial point that Andrew was making that even if they were not, you know, these documents were not disclosed to someone else, there already is a fair amount of damage that has taken place. Okay, and one more question in terms of the ingenuity of our adversaries. This sounds like science fiction, but this is what I was told in my relatively limited um, uh, exposure to the, you know, the highest kinds of levels of security. And that is that you don't need to have had people, you know, that you, we've heard about the possible Russian spy, Matahari type figure. But if you go into a to a skiff with your phone on there, you know, it's it's possible that a that a um, adversary can access some of the information without being on site is that is that true or is it only a matter of did he give it away or did somebody physically come with the little camera and and photograph it do we know well i know how ingenious we are yeah. in terms of collecting intelligence yeah. and i have to presume that our adversaries have equal ingenuity and so 
Again, just looking at Donald Trump's practices in terms of what he would do or how he would go about his daily work, um, it, I could see him being just a very, very attractive intelligence target of multiple services from around the globe, particularly at Mar-a-Lago when he was sort of left to his own devices. That is what worries me. And as Mary said, he could have already said something or shown something to somebody and uh, have disclosed it. Any hunch or sense, as the archives say, that there are actually maybe documents elsewhere from Mar than Mar-a-Lago? Andrew, what's your... Uh, they're, they're, how, how are we trying to get to the bottom? Because no, no subsequent subpoena has been served. We would know it, right? Well, just remember, the subpoena called for information wherever it is. Yeah. It was not limited. But obviously, the subpoena was not complied with, which, I mean, right. that we, we know for a fact. So, um, you know, the thing that has to be keeping the department up at night in the intelligence community is whether they, in fact, have collected everything. You know, there is Donald Trump's statement, I think, in his Hannity interview where he alluded to other locations. Um, and, you know, I, I would assume that the government does not have probable cause um, for that is the sufficient proof to um, undertake a, a warrant, uh, yeah, a court or authorized warrant, even if they were. Yeah you know, had the backbone to do yet another one. But I think they would if they actually thought there, there were these types of documents because of the national security implications that I think are the would be the ultimate driver for people like Merrick and Lisa. Yeah. All right. I'm really eager to move to the case. But uh, let me just ask John and Mary, you know, anything that people haven't quite um, realized or you think is sort of misreported or underreported out there that an aspect to the the whole national security angle that you know you is important to clarify. I think we've we've covered some you know important topics here because the initial you know reporting coming after the execution of search warrant and much of it since then has focused so much on the possibility of a criminal indictment and I and I and I, I know John and Andrew also have been trying to sort of redirect like yeah that's out yeah. there as a possibility but we have a real problem just based on you know the mishandling of a of large volume of or a significant volume of highly sensitive documents and so regardless of what happens with a the criminal investigation, this is something that people ought to understand the seriousness of. And, you know, I think that's, we've, we've set that out today and we, and we know that Mar-a-Lago is a place, you know, we've been doing best case that none of this was transmitted. Yeah. Mar-a-Lago has seen many, many guests, foreign and domestic, who seem to have access to many areas of Mar-a-Lago. And so I think part of this damage assessment, as John said, that first step is what what is the likelihood that some of this was transmitted? And that will not, that doesn't just mean because President Trump handed it to somebody. It could mean that someone gained access uh, at Mar-a-Lago through other means. And I think with respect to other locations, we should also keep in mind that there could be things at other locations that aren't related to the to the move out of the White House on January 20th in whatever haphazard um, way that might have been conducted. There could have been things during his tenure that he took to a bedroom in, you know, Bedford Hills or wherever else. Uh, and, you know, he would have had skiffs built probably at all of these locations while he was the president, but not any longer. And so it, it could be in thinking about whether there's other things missing and only the IC would kind of know and maybe wouldn't even know what things he had personally taken with him because he's it's been reported that, you know, he takes things out of skiffs with him when he goes, and normally that wouldn't be the procedure at all. So it's going to be kind of hard to tell what's missing and what's not because you don't really know what he walked off with. Yeah, yeah, well, Did the have things or didn't they? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. It's my appreciation that the security procedures throughout the Trump presidency were very lax. And a lot of the normal procedures for how you handle these documents, a lot of times they need to be logged out and logged back in. Uh, we're not, those rules were not followed. And so I have to presume that there are other documents out there that he might have squirreled away somewhere because he had this tendency to ask for things, to keep them, and then just to put them into his either briefcase or outbox and inbox and just take them back to the residence. So I'd like to think that we have the universe of documents already in, back in our possession, but I fear that whether it's in other place in Mar-a-Lago or Bedminster or who knows where else, uh, there are other uh, classified documents. Mary, I had a question based on something you were saying, which is, um, you know, 
I would have assumed because it's true for people far below the the president that there's skiffs built in people's um, personal homes um, so that they can essentially work for the government around the clock <laughs> wherever they are. Um, but one of the things that has not been mentioned is a skiff in the, at Mar-a-Lago, which we know the president, the former president, went to when he was the president. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm just surprised. I, I it, to me, it's it suggests that there may not have been a skiff um, during his presidency there. Now it's possible it was taken down. But that would, to me, be sort of more evidence that he knew that there shouldn't be classified information there because they had to remove the skiff precisely because there's no reason for it to be there anymore. Yeah, I would have assumed, and John may have more insight to this, but certainly when I was in government, the highest levels, including the president, you know, had to have an ability to review classified information when they were traveling. So. Um, there's skiffs created lots of places. I sort of would have thought it w- might have stayed up because occasionally, you know, current presidents consult former presidents about classified information. And to do so, they would need to be in a sensitive compartmentalized information facility to, to do that. Um, but it, I think you're right. If that was the case, there was one at Mar-a-Lago and there's not one any longer. I think um, either that suggests that, you know, the current president and no one in the IC has any intention of consulting the former president, or at least if they did so, they'd want to do it under a different type of a con- controlled environment. So, uh, I had a skiff in my residence when I was director of CIA, but that skiff went away as soon as I left office. It's my understanding that for former presidents, the Secret Service will use their skiffs, a uh, local office or at the FBI field offices or others, to store and retain documents and that they bring them back and forth to the residence of a former president. I don't know of any a case where a former president had a skiff actually in their personal residence. Uh, usually it would be the Secret Service that will maintain control of those documents uh, outside of that residence. I thought it was reported that he had because he used to nevertheless blab in the in the dining room instead of going, uh, well, you know, what, whatever, whatever makeshift procedures there were. Um, I'm sure he had a skiff while he was president down there. While he was, yeah, while he was president, right. there would have been a skiff. While there, he was president, but, had to be. Yeah. Um, so, Andrew, F, you know, Mr. Former FBI General Counsel. So now after the 11th Circuit decision, there are agents fanning out and trying to at least figure figure this out. They are unshackled from from canon. Yes. Yeah? So at least now there's an investigation afoot of who was, you know, who's who was employed at Mar-a-Lago and what are their right. Yeah, I mean, this, that's all that they, that's all, you know, can go off to the races that the intelligence side can use criminal process, yeah. criminal process can be used to help the intelligence side. That was the whole point of the affidavit that was submitted, which was to talk about how this is really, but yeah. both sides work together. You, I mean, to me, I sort of saw this coming because having been at the FBI, you're so used to the idea of the intelligence side and the criminal side. And I just could see Lisa Monaco, who of course was at the FBI much longer than I was, really understanding that. Um, and obviously that's true for for Mary as well, seeing that within the National Security Division. Um, and, you know, I think the, the big issue is I think this special master stuff is now such a, it's like a little pimple, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just, it's important, yeah. but it's just not, it's, it's not that important um, in terms of, in either a criminal case going forward or a national security case. I mean, there's some evidentiary things that could be very useful, but it's not, I think, where the action is in terms of... that. That's what, what I wanted to them. ask and sort of transition. Has she been now effectively neutralized? It's an irritant, but there's nothing important on either side of the house that uh, unless she crafts something new... Uh, the department can't do right. I, you know, I, I mean, theoretically, there's they. It's an action for return of property. You know, they couldn't. It, it's completely untethered from even the a criminal indictment if they wanted. Yet, yeah, is 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 that right? My own view is if Trump were smart, he would actually move. Since it's he's the plaintiff, he would actually yeah. move to dismiss the case and end it because nothing good is going to come out of this. I mean, the special master is excellent. He's pressing for issues like. Are you saying any of this was factually stolen? Um, What are you saying with respect to executive privilege? I mean, all of that is is not going to go well for the former president. 
um, you know, attorney client privilege is the only thing that I think is sort of legit, which is, you know, that's that's a handful of documents that sh- that really can take. Just and and there was always going to be well adjudicated by Reinhardt or whatever. So do well, and, and all just three of you that, agree we're, we're done with we're done with Canon effectively? I think effectively, I think I would add that to a, the point Andrew was just making that, you know, really, they've got themselves in a worse place than they than they needed to be in because, you know, the government had said, just just set aside the classified, don't make that go through this procedure, and we will give plaintiff's counsel all of the rest of the documents. They don't even need a special master. They can do their own review for attorney-client privilege, make their own assertions for attorney-client privilege. So now they're getting, you know, held to the to a lot of tasks on a on a time frame that the special master has set that they they frankly could have avoided but you know what what the department cared the most about rightfully was making sure the classified information wasn't part of that process and what i think the 11th circuit saw immediately was all of the bases for judge Cannon's ruling had no relationship to the classified information that couldn't be personal information and um and and you know the government's interest highly outweighed any interest of the president the former president so you know I, I think it does neutralize it quite considerably and i hadn't really thought andrew about your suggestion of just dismissing it but i think that would probably <laughs> no. be the easiest thing for them to do right now it's a good idea Meaning they'll never do it, of course. Uh, <laughs> Not with the uh, news right, that the, the but, one person he hired who seems to be a real right. lawyer, the news is that he's been sidelined, which you, know, you can't make with, that up. With with three million in tow. Yeah, no, I, I had the image of sort of, is it Dr. No or Goldfinger who releases them into the... You know, the uh, this is the price of failure. Except he's re- he thinks he's that, but he's really like Michael Myers. You know, it's really Austin Powers, <laughs> and with his with his new lawyer. Yeah, what a, what a there's a whole separate story there. The 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 clown car that that our Trump lawyers. All right, but it, so let's seg. This is a good segue now. What what are you? Um, and and again, the a common theme is the both sides are going to be working in tandem here, but. Focusing now on what needs to be developed, it was a little, you know, Mary made the point, we all did, that this was initially a document retrieval um, action, and so the things you might infer from this kind of large-scale search, you couldn't really do because um, uh, there was a special reason for it. All right, but now they've made clear, and they, you know, he asked, and they, they he sort of, uh, the DOJ stuck it to him before both Reinhardt and Cannon. It's an active criminal investigation. That's part of what's going on, too. What do you think is the most likely lead charge um, for, you know, if, if, if Trump is indicted? Well, you're jumping way before. Way beyond yeah. where well, I am. All right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's uh, yeah? All right. Well, I want to. I, I I wanted to then double back to the sort of investigation, but um, uh, you know, and uh, so let me let me put you on the on the spot, Andrew. Do you think we're that the focus here is on obstruction? Um, or too soon so, to say. So so here's the issue. I don't. I think there's a lot of missing pieces um, because. Um, if you just look up at obstruction, the question is, how are you going to tie any statements to statements made by the president? Yeah. It's not enough to say his lawyers said something that was misleading. It's got to be tied to him. Like We did that with Manafort and Gates. We got a ruling from Judge Howell that allowed us to ask the questions of the lawyer that the lawyer got them and was repeating them and was supposed to be repeating them to the department. But if you don't have that, you, then you don't have you don't have that false a sort of false statement charge and, and the sort of obstruction that comes from that. If it's not returning the documents as a form of obstruction, um, you know that he, that to me would is a little bit more tenuous. That it's the, that seems to to sort of overlap with the underlying charge, um, and that he wasn't returning these as part of. Uh, trying to obstruct an investigation. Remember, with the, the NARA request is not an investigation. So, I think I think it becomes tricky. Now, it is possible because the 1519 is a very very broad statute. Um, but again, you have to tie it to what he was directly told, um, and that's where the 
uh, the former White House lawyers could be incredibly important witnesses. Um, if the government gets his current lawyers to um, testify about very specific things, that could be very important. Um, and then obviously Donald Trump's own mouth is not helping him. Um, but again, I think 1519 is, to my mind, I don't look at what we know and say, oh, there's a clear 1519 charge. I, I have a lot of questions about what is the exact predication. Um, I do think that the um, simply taking government documents and not returning them, which is just stealing government documents, regardless of classification, which is a 641 charge, I actually think is, is an incredibly strong charge. And that, I think the timeline for Donald Trump is terrible. I think the fact that the government tried for so long to get these back is just a terrible fact. Um, but again, we're, we're, we're missing in the public record is the connective tissue as to what Donald Trump himself knew, because a lot of what we see is what his lawyers knew. And of course, we know as, as smart people that, of course, the lawyers had to be having conversations and keeping their client up to date. But we don't have that piece. And if you're thinking of bringing a criminal case, you need that. Um, you need to know a all of that history and what he was told and then what his actions were. So when we're hearing that he made the choice about what boxes would go back to NARA and what would stay, that would be critical proof. But we we need to know more about that. Um, so this is one where, um, you know, I, I used to be on the inside and it was great. And I watched people from the outside speculate. And that's what we're, you know, we're in that situation yeah. now. Mary, I saw you shaking your head when Andrew talked about the lawyers. So are, do we mean do we mean sort of, um, you know, Bob and Corcoran or do we mean like Phil, you know, Pat Philbin and uh, Cipollone or who who, who were you? I think about? all of the above. Right. Yeah. Because as Andrew was pointing out, we've got what was he told by his White House lawyers when he left the White House about not taking presidential records, not taking classified information, right? The importance of all of that. And then we also need to know, who, you know, was Trump behind the Bob, uh, you know, statement that was made that they did a diligent search and they recovered all of the classified that existed at Mar-a-Lago and turned it over? Was that, you know, she seemed to be purporting to be speaking on behalf of, of Trump, but but is that the case? So I think you'd want to talk to Bob and and Corcoran, you'd want to talk to to Philbin and 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 you know Stipolone in the White House Counsel, and and there could be other people too that were were present during those conversations, right? That you could also talk to. There could be things in emails or other communications that would uh, establish some of this. So there's other things that the government will be looking for. And so I think that you know I, I agree with Andrew that what what's publicly known right now, there's gaps, but. You know, I also spent a really long time inside and always knew far, far more than what was being published in the newspaper and certainly was on cable TV. I would say that, you know, if the evidence ultimately accumulated is sufficient to prove every element of obstruction beyond a reasonable doubt, there are advantages to that charge, assuming there's a decision to bring charge, which I think is another thing we should talk about, because I think that's a very, very difficult decision, even if there is sufficient evidence, but assuming there is and there's a decision to bring charges, that charge would avoid some of the problems uh, involved in revealing national defense information and classified information. So would a straight up 641 charge that Andrew was mentioning about just taking government records or even a 2071 charge of presidential records, you wouldn't necessarily have to prove up the classified nature. But um, the, the 1519 is a very serious offense. So if you're you know kind of escalating up on seriousness, um, it's a serious offense with a, with a stricter pe penalty and one that would just have to show that there was an investigation ongoing that he was aware of and intending to, uh, to obstruct. And I don't think you'd have to really get into the substance of the NDI for that. I mean, that's what appeals to me. And actually, Andrew, I, I, I'm a little, I, I'm not sure I agree with you that all the evidence that's so forceful about their, the, the concealment and the lies, and I would add to it, by the way, a pretty new revelation that back in October, I guess, 2020, Philbin 
reports that Meadows reports that that there's only 12 boxes and they're all news clippings. You know, you run that to the end. But I, I think that's sort of circumstantial evidence of the 641, but it's more direct for the 1519. Maybe we can go back to that because Mary raised the perfect issue that I, I realized I want to talk about that comes up and nobody knows anything. Uh, uh, it's the perfect thing for this panel to do. So how will we hear about the possibility that a prosecution would be encumbered, maybe even uh, um, uh, actually immobilized by the need to use uh, classified information. Um, explain a little bit, please, about how the CIPA would work here and how the DOJ, both now as it's investigating and if it comes to trial, would be able to navigate around well, what, what Trump would be trying to do, how the DOJ yeah. would respond, how that whole thing would work. Yeah. I mean, I think even before getting to that, I mean, one of the things as people are kind of thinking about why wouldn't you bring a charge if he yeah. you know, knowingly was mishandling classified information, I think one of the things that is not intuitive until you work in national security is there's like a weird inverse relationship between the significance and sensitivity of the classified information and the ability to prosecute. And that's because in order to prosecute an actual case of mishandling classified information or national defense information, you, you the government has to admit you know, to a jury that this information is national national defense information and its disclosure would cause, you know, damage up to grave damage to the United States. And oftentimes our intelligence community, and I'd like to hear from John on this, is like, no, that's a red line. We're not doing that. You know, right now it's speculation. Forget it. We don't care about your case, DOJ. It was for us. I mean, there are real, there are real there fights time. here that you guys have all participated <laughs> oh, yeah. in, right? Yeah. Two oh, sides yeah. the same house. Are, I mean, they, it gets really pretty feisty. All right. And, and there are cases not brought. Yeah. There are cases yeah. just not brought because of that. So what that means is that sometimes you're man, trying yeah. to use okay. the less sensitive information to make your case, which then, of course, doesn't have the same you know impact on the jury. So it's this weird relationship. But to SEPA, SEPA, the Classified Information uh, Procedures Act was enacted specifically to prevent something called gray mail, basically, which is which is a grayer form of blackmail, which is essentially where a defendant is saying, for me to um, really have my constitutional rights protected, and they should be protected, rights to due process and a fair trial, I need to have access to all kinds of classified information so that I can determine maybe somebody else was responsible for this mishandling, or maybe there's this defense I have or that defense I have. And if they wait and they just start doing that in trial, then it becomes a big mess at trial, and, and it's possible that classified information will then get, you know, uh, produced in front of a jury, in front of people when it really shouldn't be. So this is an entire... Um, statute that creates procedures for the government to, as part of its obligations in discovery, which means it has to provide to the defense uh, not only information that is you know relevant that is requested to to uh, the about the case, but also defense that could uh, evidence that could be exculpatory or impeaching, and by that mean I mean could be evidence that would suggest that the person who is charged didn't actually commit the crime or that undermines some of the government's other evidence, including witness testimony. So the government has to look through all of its evidence, decide what the defendant is constitutionally entitled to, and then if it's classified, it can go to the court and say, first of all, we need a protective order in order to provide it to defense counsel and defendant that says they can't transmit it to uh, anywhere else. Then there might be some of it we think is so sensitive, we want to exclude it or we want to create some sort of substitution for it, some substitution that we think adequately protects the defendant's rights and ability to prepare a defense, but is less sensitive than the actual raw classified information. The government then can there's hearings on that. The, the the judge rules on that, and then you know after those rulings on discovery, you go forward to the preparation for trial. And the defense counsel at that time under under SEPA has to say, here are all the class, here's all the classified information I intend to use at trial. And the government can again come back and say either that's a red line, then you know we got to go back talk to the intelligence community, assess assess whether we can do that, or we think that this is not relevant, shouldn't be admissible at trial, you should exclude it, judge. Or if you don't exclude it, you should allow a substitution of something else that adequately preserves 
the defendant's rights. So these are all things that are taking place pre-trial before a case even gets to the jury, and that, that way the judge is ruling on them so there's no surprises at trial. And sometimes it's during this procedure that the whole thing breaks down and the government says, we, that's it, we're not, we're dismissing this case. And you know that Trump is going to try to play that card as hard as he can. So what are how, how tangible do you see the risks here uh, to actually scuttling any prospective prosecution? I'll, I'll tell you what I would argue if I were, yeah. you know, the given licenses at the FBI general counsel to weigh in on what should happen. I'd say we are helped here by the fact that we have so many different documents to choose from. So tell me what you are most concerned about, John. Let's say John's the head of the CIA. And I'd say, John, tell me what you're most concerned about because we let we should be able to accommodate you and not use those in the prosecution. Two, we have certain types of crimes that could make this less likely that it's relevant, as we talked about 1519, 641, um, the shorthand of the obstruction and the sort of stealing government documents. And third is, let me give you sort of my, my experience. I mean, everyone always tries their last case, but when I was in the special counsel, one of the things that I found really unusual was the, we got approval to bring the um, two Russian indictments, the active measures and the hack and dump case, which detailed an enormous amount of information that was clearly sensitive to the IC, the kind of thing that I'd been in many, many meetings where we would have lost those uh, those debates, um, that it's not worth it, um, as Mary pointed out, the sort of back You've and lost forth. it to the, to the CIA. To, to the CIA or NSA or, or frankly, just roll, to be yeah. clear, the FBI sometimes is on both sides yeah, of that right. because okay, you'd have the criminal side. And the, they, I mean, they would have had these, the stronger. Just case, to be clear, yeah. these are hard issues. It's not. This is not one where you sit yeah. there and say we're totally right and you're totally wrong, and everyone sort of goes in understanding that. Um, but there are cases where are are so existential to the times we're in and so important that those though without getting into what the conversations were i mean we had clearance to go forward on both of those indictments even though there obviously was going to be an effect on methods and means um and you know if i were arguing this on the why we should go forward side i would talk about the rule of law and why that you have to be able to go forward. Now, some of that you would want to know if there's other things. I mean, if there was an incredibly strong January 6th case at the time, that might be argued against why you would go forward in a, on a case that could reveal classified information. But so we don't know the whole picture, but I, I just think that's another piece that's worth throwing in there that the IC, I think, has been more receptive than I than I had anticipated in terms of understanding the importance of a particular case. And John, so how do you think it'll play out? I mean, will the, the will the CIA or the, there just be only on the lookout for the security of uh, intelligence and sources and methods, or will will the CIA be considering, uh, you know, that the importance of the case, the stakes for democracy, rule of law, et cetera, when these uh, internal uh, discussions, uh, you know, get real? I think traditionally the CIA has been overly, overly protective of this information because they feared, even if there was a small chance of disclosure of something, they didn't want to take that risk. I do think that over time there has been a, a, a more um, nuanced approach uh, on this matter and uh, working more closely with uh, justice and, and FBI to try to find a way to ensure that the rule of law is going to be going to prevail, but at the same time that these very sensitive source of methods will be protected. I do think that the current leadership of CIA will try to be as accommodating as possible because there are uh, costs of not pursuing a, a righteous um, criminal indictment on something like this, and, and the lawyers here. Um, Broad social costs. Yeah, 
Right. right, but besides that, as far as precedent is concerned, uh, for individuals in the future who are going to do the same type of thing, uh, that if Trump is not prosecuted on this, I would think that the defense attorneys of those future <laughs> uh, people um, will right. use this as a, as a good case. So I do think that Director Bill Burns and others have to take into account the importance of this, the extent of this, uh, again, the flagrant violation of the security practices that uh, exist uh, in the intelligence community and CIA. All right, I, I really want to move, finish up with Mary's point about you know everything involved in the in in pulling the trigger on prosecuting, even assuming there's a, a righteous case that uh, fits principles of federal prosecution. But let, can I stick for just a couple minutes with a couple nitty gritty questions? Do you does anyone? And and Andrew, you, you know, eyes may turn to you first, but have a sense of of a, you know how long uh, the investigation will take to come. To, you know how much longer they need to do this as a matter of a month or two, or you know eight or ten months more or more. And does it need, as some of the January six cases seem to, uh, some kind of break in terms of? cooperation from an important um, witness or is it the is there the potential of making this a basic you know paper case a any thoughts about those sort of nitty-gritty questions well my view is that unlike the January 6th case which by the way I don't think that's a terribly complicated case either um, I mean it, January 6th? It, okay yeah I mean I think there are a lot of witnesses and people to talk to and a lot of documents but I mean I mean, again, just since you always try your last case, it's not Enron. I mean, we're not talking about calculus. I mean, it, it is really, that to me is a makeable case, but I do think there's a lot of work to do. And my, I think there, there are a lot of signs that that case is starting, not, not, it is not at all towards the end. So I think that could be quite some time. Um, the Mar-a-Lago case, the biggest issue is, um, is, we can't see exactly how it's being staffed because for, I think, good reasons, the department is clamping down on that and not doing what has traditionally been done. So like, you know, um, and the special counsel, our names were completely out there. Sometimes we did it. Sometimes the defense lawyers decided it would be a useful thing to have our names and addresses and email accounts be made public and filed in court. Um, and, you know, for very good reasons, that is being clamped down on because of death threats, um, which is just incredible that that's happening. Amazing, so right? the yeah. reason it's relevant, though, is, uh, and this is maybe, Mary can definitely correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I'm i looking for sort of AUSA types, um, p sort of the trial lawyers, the people who routinely go to court, who build criminal cases. The counter espionage group at the FBI and at DOJ do some of that, but it's not kind of their bread and butter in terms of what they're sort of built to do. But this is, again, not a complicated case. But I think if I could see who the team was, I'd have a better sense of being able to tell you, Harry, oh, you know what? <laughs> this, you know, by end of December, it's going to be done. Um, yeah. So, but I, but having said that, I personally think that a, a competent team um, with, um, I think there's very strong leadership in the attorney general and the deputy attorney general and, and their staff. Um, I Again, I think while we've talked about holes, I, I don't think this is one where you have to get the cooperation of some, you know, it, it's not like uh, Alan Weisselberg in the state case in yeah. front of uh, you know, the Manhattan DA, where they really need to have a cooperator to get to the next rung. Um, I just don't see that in this case. Where do you see them bringing it if they brought it again? DC. DC. I, DC. Mary so, Walsh, so I think uh, it's yeah. funny. I think so. I'm just going to be the counter, and then you can tell me what. But I think yeah. I think they sh they they. They don't want to bring it in D.C., but I think they have to bring it in Florida. Florida makes no sense to me. Yes, that's where the documents were found, but they were taken from D.C. And, um, and 
you know, a substantial amount of the evidence I think will derive out of D.C. D.C. judges are much more familiar with working with classified information in their cases. Uh, they've got, you know, the court security officers, which are, you know, assigned to every class, case involving classified information, are very, very familiar with SEPA and all of these procedures in D.C. And it strikes me that, you know, when you're talking about, you know, and most of our intelligence community has a presence in D.C. So it just strikes me as that's really the situs of it. And and I, I get it that maybe there'll be people who will say that that's a political move, but I think the legal reason reasons are are very, very valid. So I, I would be surprised, but I could be wrong. And again, Mary, I'm not Mary, sure. How do you, I, I, we all agree it's better in eight ways, but the, but the, I, the worry what, Andrew, is concern about looking like you're being, uh, right? But you're not forum shopping. They had to get their warrant in Florida. They couldn't have gotten yeah, yeah. it. Oh, yeah, so absolutely. They definitely had to get, you have to get the warrant where the, where you're searching. But yeah. how do you deal with the the issue that the search warrant, at least, is is about unlawful retention um, as opposed to the unlawful taking. And I would agree with you that if they have good proof, and they may, of unlawful taking from the White House, then I think it, I, then I'm totally with you, Mary. I think that then you have a non forum shopping. Uh, I agree with you completely on the, the judges and their experience, totally valid reasons. Um, well, but, if you, but without yeah. that, I, I just think having, it's it's funny during the special counsel and during Enron, those are the two sort of high profile matters I'm on. There was an enormous amount of internal pressure to not play games in any way with venue. Um, and I mean, there were a lot of reasons to be like in the Southern District of New York on a complicated securities fraud matter mm -hmm. as opposed to Houston, Texas. Texas. Um, mm -hmm. But we were going to be in Houston on Enron, period. Like that was... That was my know. experience in 9-11 where one was going to be in our... Uh, in the Western District of, of Pennsylvania. But, you know, it, it is much... Uh, it, it's it's an obvious... You know, and there's also the, the jury pool, but... Um, I, you know who who knows what? Well, I would even would the venue question ultimately go to the tippy top? Would you think? Oh yeah, you, every yeah, every be, major decision in this we'll case go, will yeah. go all the way to the top. <laughs> right. yeah. And you know, back to the point that Andrew made about not knowing the team. I mean, I would say it's been a while, but you know, high level people at Maine Justice have been. Line AUSAs, Lisa Monaco, a line AUSA. That means as a senior U.S. attorney, Merrick Garland, he's his pro prosecuting Merrick Garland. Um, Matt Olson, head of national security now, and Jay Bratt was a line AUSA for many, many years before he moved over to Maine Justice. I was a line AUS AUSA for 20 years before I moved to the National Security Division. So these are people, and I, you know, I know Lisa, I have enormous respect for Lisa. Lisa plays it super, super close to the vest, and you know that she's going to be involved, uh, you know, in every decision. And, you know, I think that's partly why we're not seeing a lot of AUSA names uh, dropped out on this. There's probably AUSAs working, but I, this case has been run out of main justice. There's no question. All right, let's move to the the sort of sixty four thousand dollar question. One sixty four thousand dollar question, the one that Mary made. You know, there's a lot of talk now. I I think um, kind of simplistic of well, you know, you can, if other people would have been charged, he must be. Um, but it is, as you say, at a minimum more complicated than that. I, I, I just would like uh, to hear everyone's thoughts about, you know, the, the ve just how hard and lonely a physician that Merrick uh, Garland, maybe with the help of Lisa Monaco and others, is going to be in, uh, because it's, it's just not going to be the final... Do you think that it's not the end of the inquiry, just that they that they you can click the boxes on the principles of federal prosecution? And if you think it's not, then you know what what will really go into the final decision of whether you pull the trigger for the first time on a prosecution of a former president? Okay, I'll go first. Um, okay. I, oh, go, ahead, go ahead. Well, I was gonna, I was gonna pull from what you said earlier, John, about the rule of law and all the, all the very, very, very 
valid reasons for returning an indictment or seeking a return of an indictment, including just accountability. I think I, I think there's little question that if the former president had left haphazardly, uh, been asked for documents, returned documents, and gone on about his way, we wouldn't even be having this discussion, even though there would have been mishandling. Now, maybe it's because we wouldn't have been able to prove the intent, but even assuming he knew he wasn't supposed to, I, I don't think there would have been prosecution. Here, there's been, you know, so many, so many chances now, the first 15 boxes, the, the subpoena that wasn't fulfilled, you know, what's happened now and his reaction to what is happening now and his complete, you know, after leaving office, his um, doubling down on disinformation. And by that, I mean, intentionally spread falsehoods about everything, about a fraudulent 2020 election, about the FBI in this particular search, about the Department of Justice, about the judge, I mean, you name it, that it, it, you know, to not do something means this is a man who's just gotten away with so many things. There's never been any accountability. On the other hand, and this is where I think, you know, maybe I spend more time in this extremism milieu than, than any of the three of you. And that's, um, fortunate for you and really sort of sucks for me, but like, <laughs> I think the government has to really also think about the consequences of um, an indictment. And I don't mean just the consequences that you're going to have retaliatory actions potentially under a future DOJ that it lacks any scruples. And I'd like to think that wouldn't happen, but we saw some of that in the last DOJ. So I, I'm not as confident as I used to be in that, but also just on the streets, you know, we've got Trump all openly talking about riots. We have Lindsey Graham talking about riots and they're not saying don't riot, respect the rule of law. They're doing the wink, wink, nod, nod. And, you know, that shouldn't necessarily be the reason not to return an indictment, but it is something that the department, you know, has to think about all of these consequences. And obviously the fingers will be pointed at them that this is a political prosecution. There are responses to that, but there's people who that won't who, who will stick with that and they will capitalize on that. They'll spread disinformation. They will agitate for violence. I think that the very flagrant and brazen intentional violation of the law by a president, uh, by a person who we entrust <laughs> with our nation's national security, I don't think it can be just set aside for the reasons that Mary said, but also I think the the eyes of the world are on the United States right now, <laughs> wondering whether or not our democratic institutions or our, our democracy is going to withstand the onslaught that we are facing. Uh, and some of that onslaught is led by people like Donald Trump and others. So yes, it is as difficult as complicated. But I don't think, you know, people say, well, we're not a banana republic. We shouldn't be, you know, prosecuting, you know, former leaders or whatever. Well, Donald Trump, I think, is truly a very unique case. And, and I do think that the government uh, as a whole, justice and others, they would need to determine how best to handle this situation, not by ignoring it, uh, understanding the implications of going forward with something. Uh, and that's why I'm so disheartened that there are so many individuals, in, members of Congress, Republican you know, leaders and officials, who do not really appreciate or at least are not willing to recognize just how, how profound this moment in our history is and are ignoring, I think, those implications. So I, I, I do think that there needs to be a reckoning here. There needs to be accountability because it has just so many implications domestically, internationally, politically, and so on. So just to pick up on the international aspect, I mean, I we would not be the first so-called first world country that has prosecuted um, a current or former leader. Um, so France and Israel come to mind. Um, and I actually view the Banana Republic argument the other way, which is that in, in this situation, with, with one caveat, we actually would be turning ourselves into a Banana Republic and if we don't prosecute. But I, the caveat is that I think that Merrick Garland is going to approach this issue um, in the way that he is approached being a judge. He is going to look at the DOJ precedent and I think pretty exhaustively for how they have gone about prosecuting under the crimes and analogous crimes to figure out whether Donald Trump would, how to treat him exactly the same as anyone else if you remove the fact that he was the former president. 
Now, some people would say, fact, frankly, the fact that he was the foreign president means he should be held to a higher standard. But even let's assume you don't even do that and you just say, I want to make sure he's treated the same. I think that America is going to do that exhaustive analysis. And I think that I think is going to lead to that he has to be charged. Um, and I think the answer to the banana republic is not that you say leaders are never going to be prosecuted. It's that you have to be sure that it is a strong case and that anybody would be prosecuted in that situation um, so that you aren't in the situation of, you know, Viktor Yanukovych going after, a, you know, doing a show trial against his, uh, his uh, opponent um, where nobody would have been prosecuted for that. Um, but I, they, it, it, to me, this is a very hard decision, but I actually think for somebody like Merrick Garland, I, I actually feel like he's really born and his background is born to make this decision. Well, everyone, you keep saying, you know, why is it hard? Uh, I mean, why is it not uh, straightforward? Uh, you know, and, uh, either way, of course, there's going to be Sturm und Drang, as, as, as Mary uh, said, and really the rightness of it will be apparent only after, you know, some time has passed, kind of as with Nixon and Ford. But, you know, the, the points that all three of, you have made not uh, e that you know even if there were a special standard to apply it, it would seem like the the worst thing next to prosecuting him is not prosecuting him but we all do, there certainly is a lot of we put ourselves in in Merrick Garland's shoes and feel kind of bad for him on the and the uh, this weekend Andrew the panel you weren't able to make Katie Benner you know analogized him to a tragic Shakespearean hero in this lonely position is it so hard I, I'm not I, that's not a rhetorical question I you know what why what what's on the other side that's so that counsels such uh hesitation well look it's the first time that It'll have been done. So you're going to want to make sure you do it right. You're going to want to make sure the standards are right. You're going to be concerned. I mean, the Department of Justice is concerned about safety. Um, and so the, the ramifications may not be why you're deciding not to do something, but you're obviously going to, it's going to weigh on you how you are going to assure the safety of the people at DOJ, including the FBI, the court staff, and the public um, in light of the reaction to it. And again, I don't think that's why it won't get done, but all of that for, for anybody um, who's heavy, yeah. smart and sensitive in the way that Merrick Garland is and Lisa is, it's gonna be, that I think that's what's gonna make it really tough. And that means you have any to have relevance a plan at all. That, you know, right? sorry, go ahead, Mary. I'm sorry. So that means you have to have a plan for addressing all of that. You just don't have your right. plan for your case and your evidence and, and your motions. You've got to, you know, have a plan for all the rest of the fallout that 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 will happen. Um, I'm not sure where they will. Is it of any relevance at all that uh, you know, if if it takes a while and a, and a Republican wins the White House, including conceivably Donald Trump? That the whole thing could um, evaporate, or that's essentially a non a non issue issue to consider now. I don't think the decision on the Mar-a-Lago case would extend yeah. to January twentieth, twenty twenty five. I mean, that's still a long way. No, but the pro but the pro I, but the prosecution could right. He's Yes. Um, yeah. Right. So you're talking about actually stepping in and thwarting, which I'd say that won't happen. But again, that did happen under the last yeah. administration with respect to two prominent cases, Roger Stone and Michael yeah. Flynn. So um, I don't I don't even want to, you know, speculate about this because it's too depressing. And, and, and don't you have to ignore it? It seems I mean, it's real, but I, I don't see how that could uh, corrupt your decision making. You process. can't let that play into this decision. I mean, what's yeah. really disheartening is that there's so many public officials who have gone out of their way to discredit the legitimacy of our judicial process. Um, and that's why no matter what happens here, if there's any type of indictment or charges levied against uh, Donald Trump, you're going to have, you know, his base plus more who are going to believe that it is purely a political, politically motivated charge and are not going to have confidence that this is the rule of law. 
And, and that's why the, the comments that people are making, um, whether they be members of Congress or um, people on certain cable news network programs, it just fuels that animus that I think so many people have right now that will manifest itself, unfortunately, I think, you know, if there are going to be charges brought and they're going to they're going to fuel those fires, which is just incredible to think that in this day and age in the United States, we have people in positions of public trust who are going to do that. But and but just to put the counterpoint, and then and I'm sure you, it's all implicit in what you're saying. The you know the open source of not doing any the kind of open source on the democracy, even if it's not even if the people who uh, push it are not you know taking to the streets and trying to to shoot people, is very strong. And I and I think that you know, Garland will be taking the long view. It's inevitable that uh, that in the short term, though it's stepping on a hornet's nest, kind of either way. But, you know, there there's a, a right answer and a wrong answer is I think the way he'll look at it, even if it's close, and, and, and that will be apparent, you know, in time. Final thoughts on this? What do you, what's your, what's your gut say? A lot of people who, who were, you know, uh, not uh, predicting uh, bad, you know, his demise as others were have now seemed to sort of go and say this is we're really looking at uh, at, at a, a likely uh, problem. Uh, and and John, I know you have to go. So if uh, if anyone wants to wants to offer a gut view, um, and otherwise we'll sign off on what's been a great discussion. Well, I'll just briefly say that, you know, I think Donald Trump has been, unfortunately, masterful and very clever in terms of how he has escaped uh, other uh, challenges uh, to uh, a lot of his behaviors out there. But I do think that this time is is very different. Uh, I do think he's going to be held to account. And uh, I think he's gotten himself into a situation where I think we see more and more people abandoning him. And uh, the fact that he doesn't really have a lot of, you know, high class uh, lawyers uh, rushing to try to defend a former president of the United States, I think that is telling in itself of just how poor he is positioned right now. So, uh, but at times like this, I don't know whether I'm speaking with my head or my heart. <laughs> I'm hoping that it's going to be both. But I, I do think uh, as someone who has held security clearances for over 40 years and has you know served you know my life in national security, I just find what he did um, just to be absolutely appalling and something that needs uh, some accountability. Amen to that, shall we say, and 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 call it call it a uh, discussion. Thank you so much, Mary, John, Andrew, uh, for this unusual and and I think really interesting uh, time together. So um, I hope we can do it again sometime. Thanks so much. Good to see everybody. Bye.